Good morning, ladies. I hope this carries out to the brickyard and to get people to come on in. Um, as we do need to start, I have a couple of quick announcements also. But they're such good announcements, I hate to, to give them when, if no one is listening. You can just say, come on, come on, come on. See, that, this must carry into the brickyard, but um, it does not carry into the rooms, does it? We might. We, 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 you know, if we would like the, in schools, you know, where the bell sounds all over the building, that's what we really need. What? Your whistle. Oh, where's my whistle? It, it, I, it's, it is at home. I still have it. I should have. And can y'all tell me I've eaten a little bit of candy. I told Margaret I had a really long day yesterday, so I just needed a little bit of candy today. I think I, I will go ahead and pray. I, I know that uh, most of our groups are not here because mine, I see mine is not here. I got up and left. Um, but let me go ahead and pray and start us. Father God, we thank you so much for today. We thank you for bringing us here in worship of you, in the method of small groups. I thank you that how looking at each other and seeing you in one another is such a challenge to us and such an encouragement. Father God, I pray that you would, through your Holy Spirit, speak into my life today. I, I know there are things that you are continuing to do, and um, we hide them from others, but they are there and we know them. So Holy Spirit, work in me and work in each of these ladies here this day. We thank you, we love you, and we, we uh, appreciate so much being here. It's in the name of Jesus we pray. Amen. When you leave today, there on the little table back there, there are some folders, uh, flyers. Uh, one is our mayor has called for this Thursday at uh, tomorrow at Coleman Hill. There is a call to prayer. That's this one. And it is for the... Uh, Hope for the Heart of, of Georgia, which will be next spring as a part of Cherry Blossom, that uh, uh, our church is supporting, and I know many uh, many other churches in our city are. But so grab grab these two things. You are invited to everything. The other quick announcement is, and this is going to sound like it's for members of our church, but it's for anyone. We're having a fun evening get-together at Sheila Johnson's October 3rd, which is Monday week. And our dear Ponch is in charge of the fun part. So uh, someone asked me what she was going to do. I don't know, but that's okay. Um, I'm in charge of getting people to bring goodies, so I'll do that. Uh, but you're all, everyone is invited to her house at 7 o'clock for about an hour, hour and a half. And so please come. Today, um, want our Archer will be our speaker talking about our lesson for next week. Iris needs no introduction for us. But uh, first, um, we have... Uh, our, our testimony or go share her life. Where, where are you? I know. Molly, would you come on up? This is Molly Walker. Some of you uh, do not. Molly had, and her husband have been members of our church just really a short time. And so some of you may not know her. But we have had lunch and, and I'm thrilled that I do. And I want you to get to know her too. So Molly. Thank you. Oh, I really didn't want to do this. <laughs> so y'all have to bear with me. Um, I grew up in Columbus, and for, not fortunately, I've decided that I'm not ever using that word again. I'm going to say I was blessed by having parents that took me to church Sunday morning, Sunday, morning, Sunday night, Wednesday, 
every time the church doors were open, we were there. Um, and I've also decided that I'm not gonna use the word coincidence anymore. Um, because I had led, I thought, pretty much a charmed life. <clears throat> Excuse me, I kept grandbabies this weekend and they were sick, so. Um, anyway, uh, I had led pretty much a charmed life um, up until that point. I went to Wesleyan here in Macon, thought I would never come back to Macon, and here I am. <laughs> But um, I'd lived a pretty much charmed life. Red and I, on a whim, we thought, uh, decided to go to summer school at Georgia, summer quarter at Georgia. And we met. I had been there five days, and we never dated anybody else. Two years later, we got married, moved to Thomasville, and lived there for seven years. And during the time we were in Thomasville, we decided it's time to start having babies. Well, I figured, you know, all my friends were having babies. Everybody was having a baby. Dogs were having babies. Cats were having babies. Everybody was having a baby but me. Um, and I just, I was like, what in the world is wrong? And back in the early 80s, there weren't a lot of fertility doctors around. Um, there was one in Atlanta. And there was one in Augusta, Dr. Greenblatt. I don't know if y'all have ever heard of him, but he was pretty much famous. I think Elizabeth uh, Taylor went to him for things. Anyway, um, I went to finally found him. We were still in Thomasville, lived, um, had to drive five hours to Augusta to go see him. Again, another coincidence, not a coincidence, but God. Right after I started going to him, my husband got a job offer in Augusta. And so we moved to Augusta, and we were able to have one daughter, Libby. And she is a, I, it took me a while to remember after high school, but she was a, she's a miracle. And, uh, <laughs> you know, you go through that part and you're like, oh, I don't know. I, are you sure you gave me the right one? Um, but anyway, uh, so at Dr. Natrogen helped me have Libby. We found out the reason that I was having trouble having babies is that my mother, unbeknownst to her, but thank goodness she remembered the name, was, took diethylstilbestrol, DES. And so I'm a DES baby which we, at that point, nobody knew what it did. They thought it caused cervical cancer. But it turns out that it affects your um, reproductive system. So, the fact, we almost lost her. She was, I mean, I stayed in the hospital and in the bed and all that. Ended up having eight pregnancies. I had, I lost a baby at six months. I lost a baby at four months. And then I had several ectopic pregnancies. And Dr. Nostrogen, who is my favorite person in the whole world because he helped us get Libby there, um, he kept trying to save my tubes because he said, oh no, they're, they're great. And my husband finally said, uh-uh, this is it. Eight times we're not doing this anymore. So I thought, what in the world is going on? And I have to tell you, I was mad at God. I was so mad at Him. I, I knew He was there. I was just like, why aren't you answering my prayers? And I think part of it that had affected me so much is that I had worked at DFACS. And all these people were having babies and couldn't pay for them and couldn't take care of them. And I was like, but I could. I really could. So anyway. After, you know, even when we're not faithful, God is still faithful. He is so faithful. He brought to my attention, we lived in Augusta at this time, he brought to my attention other ladies in our church that were having problems, not only with infertility, but were having problems with maybe they were a young widow or maybe they lost a child. We got together and started a, a ministry called 101. So if we knew somebody in our church lost a baby, you know, had a miscarriage, whatever, um, somebody that had had that happen to them went and talked to them. And it was such a good 
good ministry at our church. I hated, when we moved to LaGrange, I hated to leave it um, because it really did help. You know, when, you, when you're going through this by yourself, you feel like you're the only person in the world that has this problem. I, I got where I couldn't go to Mother's Day, Mother's Day at church. You know, one of the churches we went to, they had all the mothers stand up. Well, I, I didn't go back. So anyway, but God was faithful in that, in the fact that he brought that ministry that I could, I could help with. Um, then we've um, moved here to Macon, and he has continued to be faithful to me. He continues to guide me and direct me in my paths. I just have to be open to it. And I know that we all have troubles. And what's so sad is that sometimes you feel cl more close to God when you're going through the troubles than when everything's going great. Um, and I, maybe that's why we have trouble, so we can remember where we need to be. But he has been faithful to us all the way through our lives. And I have a 38-year-old daughter who, um, and now I have two grandbabies, and so everything has turned out just beautifully for us. Um, I just, I, I cannot, I, I can't tell you enough how much God has meant to us going through troubles and going through all this. We've had a lot of things going on. My husband lost his job in 2008. Um, but, you know, God has kept us. He promised he would be with us and he has been with us and he has proved faithful ever since. So, um, I just, I'm, I'm thrilled that, that I'm able to, I'm, I'm thrilled that he called me. I'm thrilled that he loves me. And I'm thrilled that I know that because of him, I'm going to have eternal life. And I'm going to see all my little babies up in heaven. So um, thank you very much. Well, are you enjoying the study, the book of John? Are you knowing Jesus better? <laughs> this summer, I had three of my grandchildren, took them to a water park, okay? We had a great time. Eight-year-old twins, Sue and Joel, five-year-old Audrey, we're there at the water park having a blast. Look over at the concession stand. They sell snow cones. Joel had been wanting a snow cone all summer long. So we go and we get snow cones with the twins. And uh, Audrey decided she wanted an ice cream sandwich. So as we're over here enjoying our little treats, uh, the twins, it takes you a while to have a snow cone, to eat that snow cone. Audrey, however, she dismissed her ice cream sandwich in about three bites, it was gone. And so for the next five to seven minutes, she is pestering them. Hurry up, hurry up, I wanna go back to the water slide. I wanna do this, I wanna do that. Can't you just, can't you just throw that away? Haven't you had enough? It was just on and on. And finally I looked at Audrey very calmly and I said, Audrey, life is not always about you. She threw up her little five-year-old hands and she said, I know all about Jesus. <laughs> you see, her dad is a pastor. <laughs> I know all about Jesus. And I said, I didn't even mention Jesus. Well, I know all about him. <laughs> so I hope you are learning about Jesus uh, in this uh in the book of John because we're certainly seeing his deity. We certainly are going deep into who he is. Today, we're going to look at two things in these chapters, eight through 10. The first is we're gonna look through um, eight, 31, 32, and then we're gonna look at the parable of the Good Shepherd. It's too much to cover. Uh, I have uh, started with 12 pages. Y'all are very blessed that I can really cut this down. But I want to read portions of the parable of the Good Shepherd. And I want you to think as I, as I read 8, 31, 32, I want you to see that, that verse as a lens verse 
in looking at the parable of the Good Shepherd. So let me read uh, these these verses to you. Again, you can open up your books. I'm going. I'm reading the New American Standard because that's my that's the version I have. But uh, I'm just going to skip through some of the passages of the Good Shepherd. But first, let me read eight. 31, 32. If you abide in my word, then you are truly disciples of mine, and you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. Isn't that an amazing verse? It's just wonderful. Okay, now let's get down to uh, passages of chapter 10. <laughs> First four verses. Truly I say to you, whoever enters enters by the door into the fold of the sheep but climbs up some other way he is a thief and a robber but he who enters by the door is a shepherd of the sheep to him the doorkeeper opens and the sheep hear his voice and he calls his own sheep by name and leads them out when he puts forth all of his own he goes ahead of them and the sheep follow him because they know his voice Skipping down to verse uh, 8. Truly I say to you, I am the door to the sheep. All who came before me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep did not hear them. Verse 11. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. Verse 14 and 15. I am the good shepherd, and I know my own, and my own know me. Even as the Father knows me, and I know the Father, and I lay my life for the sheep. I lay my life down for the sheep. Now let's skip down to 24 through 30. The Jews then gathered around him and were saying, How long will you keep us in suspense? If you are the Christ, tell us plainly. Jesus answered them, I told you, and you do not believe the works that I do in my Father's name that testify of me. But you do not believe because you are not of my sheep. My sheep hear my voice and I know them and they follow me. And I give eternal life to them and they will never perish and no one will snatch them out of my hand. My Father who has given them to me is greater than all and no one is able to snatch them out of my Father's hand. I and the Father are one. The Jews picked up stones again to stone him. Let us pray. Lord, just right now, I pray that your Holy Spirit would be our teacher and that your, the truth and goodness of your words and the grace that you bring through your Holy Spirit to enlighten us would be our teacher. I pray this in Christ's name. Amen. So the world has not changed much. We're still wanting to pick up stones to throw at Jesus. When I was studying this particular passage of the Good Shepherd, I think I looked at about 21 nuggets of truth from that passage. There are probably more. This is a rich, rich passage. But Jesus tells us in Mark 10 and 17, when he is talking to the rich young ruler, that the word good is used to only describe God. And yet now we are talking about the Good Shepherd. So I hope you will be encouraged this morning by seeing the truth of God's Word and the truth of the definition of goodness. Because I think we get those things mixed up. We want to take the word good and we want to look at it through a very worldly perspective. This is not what God calls us to do. So I have sort of condensed uh, some linchpin's truth from the Good Shepherd parable. And I so there are five things I want to bring out. And I've tried to combine as much as I can from these verses. But the first truth that we see in this parable is that Jesus is the only way to God. Let that sober you right now. He is the gatekeeper. He stands at the gate. His sheep hear his voice. You know, sheep are described as dumb animals. I did some research on sheep. 
this should also suffer. <laughs> so she have to have a shepherd. They have to have someone that they can hear the voice to follow. If they don't, if the shepherd is not where they can see him, do you know that a sheep can go off? One sheep can go, he can go toward a cliff, and the others will follow him. There have been stories of like a herd of sheep. Is it a herd? Anyway, 2,000 sheep falling off a cliff because one fell off. Isn't that it? Does that tell you a little bit about your mind? I mean, it's kind of like humbling, isn't it? That this is how we are described in the Bible. We are sheep. Um, you've probably heard you said this to your teenager. Well, if everybody else was doing this, jumping off a cliff, would you do the same thing? Well, this is where we get this from. Because we are like this. But suffice it to say, there is no other way to get to God except through Jesus. He brings the light of his kingdom to our hearts. He calls us, and he paid the price for our sins. But what is the lie we hear? And this is what I want to do some contrast. Jesus is the way, he is the truth, he is the life, he is at the gate, but what is the lie we hear? We hear universalism, that there are many ways to God. That God is like it being at the top of a mountain. He's up here, and all these paths lead to God. And you know what that means? That we are entitled. Think about that. That's really what that says. As a human being, you're just entitled. You're entitled. We still hear that word a lot. God owes you eternal life. This is what, he, this is what universalism really says. That God owes this to you. <coughs> However... If universalism is true, I mean, what's really the point of life? What's really the point of any laws that we have? Because there are no consequences. If we're all roads lead to heaven, wow, there's no consequences. The other thing is that um, God is really not interested in justice then. If all roads lead to heaven, that God is not interested in justice. What's the point? then there would be no reason for Jesus to come, would there? No reason at all for him to come. If truth is relative and all roads lead up here, why did Jesus come? So we can see from a biblical point of view and from this parable of the Good Shepherd, there is only one way to God. So when you contemplate redefining God in terms of you are entitled you are doing, you're buying into what the world is telling you. This is what you're doing. And it's hard. I mean, I, I know that we all have questions about that. Bottom line is we have to trust God's goodness in this. We have to trust His grace in that. We have to trust that God has made a way for us. And He says, if you seek me, you will find me. If you call on my name, I'll, you will be saved. So we have to see Jesus, however, He is the gateway, gatekeeper. He is the only way. And we need to own that truth as Christians. We not, need not to be waving about by other doctrines. But we need to see God's goodness is that He made a way for us to know Him. He made a way for us to know Him as the truth and the way and as the gatekeeper. The second thing that we see in this is that God is personal to us. Verse 3 tells us, Jesus knows our names. He knows your name. He calls us, and we recognize his voice. What another sobering truth. Let that sink in. I was uh, at the planetarium at the Museum of Arts and Sciences with these same three grandchildren, and... You've probably been to the planetarium, but it's kind of awesome experience because you're sitting in this chair, and you're looking up, and you see the expanse of what appears to be the heavens, the, uh, the outer space, the solar systems, this and that, and, all, and, this, and you just see it. And all of a sudden, the immensity of God's creative abilities are overwhelming. They're just overwhelming. Think about that. This same God knows your 
name. He knows your name. That is beyond my finite mind to grasp how personal he was or he is. When I was in college, I used to say I was building a testimony. Um, I have since looked at that and think I really spent some wasted years in college. I was a Christian, but I had a tendency to compartmentalize my faith. I had a tendency to sort of bump up as a sheep, bump up at the fence to try to look on the other side of the fence. And God was so gracious to me during that time. I heard his voice now in my head, but I, I could sense, I could sense the shepherd, the good shepherd taking his shepherd staff with the crook and grabbing me by the neck and pulling me back. Iris, don't go there. Don't go there. You need to leave this place. This is not for you. Don't do that. I heard it and I knew it. I don't know really why God put up with me. Now you may have had some times in your life when uh, even though you had made a profession of faith, you were sort of wandering around. Uh, or maybe I'm just alone in that, but I doubt it. <laughs> but God put up with me. Why did he put up with me? I mean, I've thought about that so many times. God, why didn't you just cut me off? Why? He had already called me by name. He knew me. He was my personal Savior. Why? Because I am his child. I'm his child. Just like you have children. Many of you have children. Not everyone, but many of you have children. And you know how much you love your children. We just heard Molly's uh, testimony and how much she longed for a child. That's something God puts in our hearts. And once we have a child or children, we can't, we can't conceive our life without them. And we love them. We give them a name. We look for them. We look for their smiles. We look for uh, the way they live. And we want to nurture them and discipline them. God does the same thing with us. We serve a God. And this is the truth. And I hope you see God's goodness. We serve a God who is intimately acquainted with all of our ways. He formed and fashioned us. The world, however, lies and says, well, if, he, if there is a God, he's not personal. He just sort of created things, and then he just sort of steps back. That's another lie that we hear. Um, and, hey, it may be that if the good in your life outweighs the bad, then you may, you know, have some type of peaceful, blissful afterlife. This is what the world says. God is impersonal. He doesn't care. We heard that during 9-11, didn't we? Where is God now? Where is God now? I love Ann Graham Lott's uh, response to that when she was asked, I think, by Jane Polly. Where is God now? And she said, God is where he's always been. However, we have said we don't want you in our schools. We don't want you in our culture. We don't want you in our govern government buildings. And like the gentleman he is, God has left. Jane Pauley did not know what to say. But what that means is that we have, when we push God out of every sphere of our culture, then we get what we're left with. And all we have to do is look around and see what we're left with right now. But God is not impersonal. The truth is, God's ways are hidden. No one is his counselor. We don't explain all the mysteries of God. Our goal is to have a biblical perspective of, of God and see him through the perspective of the Holy Spirit that leads and guides us. Now what did that original verse say? It said, abide in him, ingest him, be connected to him, and we talked about that in our groups, didn't we? Uh, Jesus being the bread of life. Bring him into who you are. Let him change you. Let him do that, and he will do it. And it is freeing to know that he paid the price for whatever you've done in the past, what you're doing today, and what you will do in the future. 
So God's goodness <coughs> reigns in that. The third linchpin truth is that there is a great deceiver. They're thieves, they're robbers of all kinds of people trying to lead us astray. Well, where do we see that? There's a principality of darkness in the world. And we live in a state of continual spiritual warfare. You see it every day. Every day. There are many voices in the world right now vying for your attention, speaking lies to you. The great deception of the principalities of darkness are like roaring lions. These are the lies that we often hear. <coughs> the ultimate goal in life is to be successful, to be happy. To be happy. That's, that's your goal, is to be happy. Isn't that what the lie says? Now, I have really searched the scriptures. It's really hard for me to find that as a biblical truth. Now, God doesn't want us to be miserable, but God is much more interested in us growing in Christ's likeness than He is in our personal happiness. And He will do what it takes to bring us more like Christ. Having whatever you want, being whatever you want, deciding that you can change and be whoever or whatever you want. That's a lie that we are hearing now. Material possessions will bring you joy and happiness. Now, how many times have you picked up the paper and you've seen some star or someone who had everything at their disposal, everything, and they committed suicide? But they had wealth, wealth out just beyond our imagination. And yet, they thought that was going to bring them happiness. It doesn't. It doesn't. The other lie we hear is always listen to your feelings. They will lead you. Now, I don't know about you, but if I acted on my feelings every time I was either angry or bitter or disappointed, uh, yeah, I would be on the roller coaster just like this. But we're not called to act on our feelings. We're called to act on the truth. We're called to be obedient. Now, lest you think I don't think feelings are important, they are barometers. But what their barometers are, are what's important to us. Now, here's what makes me angry. Being in traffic. <laughs> now, isn't that the stupidest thing you've ever heard of? Just like everybody that goes before me is supposed to be, you know, going at my pace, uh, which would be like the Indy 500 on the page. <laughs> but we, we, but my feelings are, I, because I'm, if I'm at point A, my goal is to point B at point B, and I want to get there in the quickest way possible. That's just my personality. That's our default. That's our carnality speaking, that we process life through that. That's your default position. Each of us have different personalities, but that's true. That's usually, we have to think about God, bring the spirit of truth. Lord, you are in me and you are for me and you are with me. Help me to process life through that. Help me to pray at this slow poke in front of me. Help me to pray for the person who has 50 million coupons in the grocery line. Uh, and, and all of a sudden decided, oh, I need to pay for this. Where is my billfold? And is searching around in a purse that's like this and pulling out, you know. You get the picture. That's our impatience. That's my carnality. Uh, you have your own little sack of rocks. So we are not called to follow our feelings and everything. We're called to follow the voice of Jesus. Why? He, we can hear Him. You know and I know if the Spirit of the Lord lives in you that you hear from Him. You're convicted of sin, you know. We're called to follow Him. The fourth thing is Jesus is the one who brings us abundant life and He defines what that abundant life looks like. I have got 20 million little notes here about abundant life. I've looked that up. I've tried to study what abundant life. But first of all, I'm going to tell you what abundant life is not. Abundant life is not the American dream. 
It's not to make you comfortable. It's not to have, it's not the prosperity gospel. It's not to give you everything your heart has desired. That is not the abundant life. Well, what is the abundant life? The abundant life is an eternity focused life. It's looking to the Lord. It's looking to be changed to become more like Christ. It is looking to change our mind and our heart. We see that in Romans 12, 1 and 2. That we are to know what the will is of God is by changing our mind to be more like Him. That's the abundant life. We might look at verses that say, No eye has seen, no ear has heard what God has prepared for us. And that stirs our, stirs our hearts. Ladies, this life is not Eden. We destroyed Eden a long time ago by our sin. We long for Eden. And it's not wrong to long for material possessions. But if they are your focal point, and if you think that that is what the abundant life is, a prosperity gospel, you're going to be sorely disappointed. Horizontal relationships and what this world has to offer will never bring abundant life. It will never bring it. Abundant life is really defined by our relationship with God, growing in grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior <coughs> Jesus Christ and becoming more like Him. It's the upside down gospel. The first shall be last. The last shall be first. It's that gospel. The gospel of being persecuted on occasion. The gospel of being humble. The gospel of thinking of others as more important than yourself. The gospel of looking at your actions and seeing Galatians 5.22, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control as what you want to produce in your life. That's the abundant life. Knowing that this life, ladies, is a preparation for the next life. Every tear. <coughs> Every tear will be gone. You will have a resurrected body. God will bless you in ways you will be sinless. I look forward to that more than I think most anything else. To be at the feet of Jesus and to be sinless. Because that means I'll have the right perspective about life. And that's where we grow in grace. God is calling us to do that. The fifth thing. And the last linchpin truth that I want to talk about is that Jesus is God. Now we know that. That's not a news bulletin to you this morning. But I think let's look at the, the Pharisees and how they were looking at who Jesus was. They come up and say, tell us plainly who you are. Isn't that amazing? He's done all this stuff and they're still confused. Tell us plainly. You, you would not blame Jesus if he threw up his hands and, and just said, are you kidding me? You don't know who I am? I just made a blind man see. I healed a paralytic. I raised the dead. And you don't know who I am. Very patiently, he challenges them. You don't know me because you don't know God. Now, that is kind of an interesting thing to look at. Why did they not know God? These are Jewish religious leaders. and They did not know God. <coughs> Why? Because they wanted God to be by their definition. They wanted to put God in a box. And I think this is something we have to be very careful about. We cannot define God. We cannot put him in a box. We can't. He is, now he has disclosed to us what we need to know about him. But there's a part of his ways that are mysterious and no one is his, is his counselor. Do we want the goodness, the good shepherd to fit our definition of good? 
Think about that. Do we want, are we pharisaical in that? That Jesus must, he must fit in this box? Uh, Paul David Tripp says, do we want Neiman Marcus Jesus? <laughs> Pretty true sometimes. Uh, I shared my group today that I used to try to figure out how to pray to get what I wanted. That's full disclosure. Like, I, there's got to be a prayer. I'm just missing something. Because Jesus says, ask, you know, ask what you will, and I'll give it to you. Well, that I take that verse out of context, which means, oh, then I have a license to get what I want. That's the prosperity gospel. That's the I want to be comfortable gospel. But the Pharisees, like us, we have we can be arrogant. We think we know. Like Audrey. I know all about Jesus. No, we're on a learning curve about Jesus every day of our lives, every experience, every sin, every time we repent, we learn more and more about Him. But the lies of the world say the God that I worship, wanted, want, you know, He wouldn't do that. He wants me to be happy. But Jesus confronts the Pharisees and said, you don't know God. You don't know God. The Bible tells us that the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. And it is plain the Pharisees did not fear God. They did not fear God. Why? They picked up stones to throw at Him. They crucified Him on the cross and we would have done the same thing. That's the sobering hard truth. So, let's look at the parable of the Good Shepherd and see God's Pray, goodness, no one can snatch you out of the hand of Jesus. This is the Savior that died for you. This is the Savior that loves you enough that He will not give up on you, even when you're in college and different places in the world and you want to bump up against the fence. He calls you by name. So this is the heart of why we should know the truth and why this sets us free. Because it's very freeing, it's very freeing to know who you are in Christ and to know the spiritual riches that are available to you and the very great goodness that God overshadows you with every day that you don't even think about. Listen to His voice because He calls you by your day. Let me pray for you. Lord, we love you, and we don't know why you put up with us, God, but you do. And you love us with an everlasting love that we cannot imagine. You died for us. You were crucified on a Roman cross for us. And you are the good shepherd. And you still will not allow us to stray, God. We hear your voice. God, help us to listen to your voice every day and love you with all our heart, soul, and mind. And I pray this in Christ's name. Amen.